Well, let, let's get right into this, man. For those people that don't know you, tell mm-hmm. us a little bit about who you are, your business, and how long you've been doing what you're doing. Yeah. So my original core business um, is real estate sales. And um, like a lot of teams, I kind of accidentally became a team because I had more leads and more business than I could handle myself. And so I started taking on agents. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And of course, as uh, better and better systems have become available to us, teams have have sprung up all over North America. And um, after a long time trying to find the right CRM through trial and error, we ended up with Follow Up Boss. And uh, that's been a, a huge benefit to what we do. Nice, man. All right. So tell us a little bit about your team. What's the structure like? Because everybody's yeah. got a different team. Yeah. So um, a lot of people know the saying, uh, the riches are in the niches. And um, when I did, and this is going back 20 years ago, I didn't know what a SWOT analysis was, but I, in our environmental assessment, but I, I kind of did one and realized that in my city, 330,000 people, there was no agent that was really purporting themselves to be the income property specialist. And there was like 850 agents at the time. And I owned a couple of student rental properties from when I was a, a university student. And um, I said, okay, uh, I'm the income property specialist. And of course, <laughs> your business grows very quickly. I, I, I soon discovered uh, uh, investors from the, the, the GTA, which is the general Toronto area, love uh, pouring their money into Windsor because of the discrepancy between the average home value there versus the average home value in Windsor. And for 20 years, we've kind of built that up and we've become uh, private equity uh, players uh, uh, out of that. I'm, I'm at a point where like, I'm joint venturing with a real estate income trust on uh, development projects and all that kind of thing. Um, but you're not able to do those wow. kinds of things, you're not able to invest properly and do those projects unless you learn how to free up your time first, right? Most right. real estate, and we just, you give us 80 hours, we're going to work 82 hours. Right. <laughs> That's so true. And if we work 82 hours, it's like, oh, I could have got another deal done. And it's like, we, we run on a different philosophy. Our philosophy is more um, uh, basically try to make as much money as we can per hour. And with that money, uh, invest in passive income streams. So our whole team vision is to get to a point of independent wealth where we can choose to sell real estate if we want to. And about three of us have already achieved that out of seven of us, where we're choosing wow. real estate rather than needing to, to pay the bills. All right. So explain to me the philosophy and, and where you started thinking about going that route versus what we see the whole real estate world do. <laughs> so it starts with a backport, backpack and a passport. Um, yeah, it really does. It really, it, you know, when you travel the world and you see how much harder we work in North America versus like my cousins in Wales or, you know, um, the happiest people I've ever met in Thailand, you know, and it's like, okay, they're not working as hard as us and they seem a lot happier <laughs> and they're relaxing in cafes. And it's like, man, I got no time to relax in a cafe. I'm burnt out all the time. And, and um, I was just like, man, there's got to be a, a better way. And there's these other things I want to do in life. I'm going to try and work four hours. Or sorry, I'm going to try and work four days a week. Okay. And so okay. one of my investor clients from Toronto, she says, oh, there's a book called uh, The Four Day Work Week. I said, great. I went straight to chapters. And I said to the woman in there, I said, lady, I, I need this book, The Four Day Work Week. And she's typing on the computer and she's like, oh, there's no four day work week, but there's a book called the four hour work week. And I mean, you could probably hear me laughing all the way out the door. I mean, I laugh so hard. Yeah, right. Four hours a week. Yeah, right. That's a book by Tim Ferriss. And that became a sort of corporate backbone to everything we do philosophy wise. Um, I find a lot of people that read books like that, A, don't implement them or B, don't think big chunks of the book apply to them which is a huge fallacy. You've got to really challenge yourself to say, you know, this applies to me, you know? And um, I think it's true in every city where the top producers tend to be divorced, (laughs) overweight, like stressed out, like, and it's, it's the same here. 
you know, and I just didn't want to be one of those guys as I was getting older and got, or gals uh, getting older. And uh, it's been great, man. It's really freed up my time to do other things in life, including sort of the private equity investment stuff, which generates even more money than you can make uh, doing real estate sales. And um, I even got into acting and movie production. Um, I've had a blast. I've had a blast, but I've had a blast without working 80 hours a week on the sales hamster wheel. All right. Well, let's talk about that because we're everybody here is a follow-up boss user. I want to yeah. get into automation, uh, elimination, and delegation. Right? Yep. Because that, uh, by the way, the four-hour work week, uh, four-hour work week, is um, or whatever it's called, uh, I don't, I'm yeah, not going to blank. Um, is one of my favorite books. We've read it over. I don't know. I think I'm on my sixth time reading it. Yeah. I've got 25 virtual assistants, and so yeah, we've definitely implemented. I want to know though, how are you automating this, and how are you bringing in follow up boss with it? Um. Well, another book that's um, is really good to, to read is um, uh, The Millionaire Agent by Keller of Werner Keller. Yeah. And, uh, where, uh, Keller Williams, rather. Werner Keller's a lawyer in Windsor. <laughs> Keller Williams. That and uh, that book was uh, a great compliment because it shows how to structure your team for efficiency. Yeah. So then when you have a structured team and you've got a corporate structure and you understand where you're supposed to be in it. You're trying to get to a point where you own the team, right? And now you're out of the sales and you're working, you're working on the business rather than working in the business. That's and for top producers, it's the hardest transition because not natural salespeople want to sell, right? Um, I haven't done a direct sale since November, 2015. That's I awesome, yeah, I, I, most of the time, I can't even tell you what my active listings are because I trust my agents that they're going to hit their goals and we track their goals and we track the number of leads they're getting as opposed to the results. Cause we, they're, they're natural salespeople. We know they're high on results. So we don't have to track those things. When, when your agents win 95% of uh, listing presentations, why do I need to track that? It's a waste of time. Why do I need to worry about it? Once I get them a lead, I don't have to worry about that because they've been trained to a point where they have those efficiencies that as long as we know the number of leads, quality leads that are getting inputted into them, we know, uh, what the results are going to be. And we follow up once a week, make sure they're okay. But beyond that, you don't have to micromanage and babysit top salespeople. And the reason we're able to retain top salespeople is they share the team vision, right? Mm -hmm. They all want to achieve the same thing that we've put in place, which is taking their active income, converting it into passive income through real estate investment, and getting to a point where they can choose whether they want to sell real estate or not. And they are encouraged to take big vacations. So one of my guys, he'll take off to, to Florida five weeks a year at once. Like he's gone for five weeks and the other teammates will take care of his stuff. Most of our team will take two, three week vacations over in Europe. Your teammates cover you, right? So um, the, the, we're trying to sort of maintain a quality of life a lot closer to a European rather than a North American. In doing that. So then where the automation elimination and delegation comes in, uh, it's all over the place. It's all over the place, but it does start with making sure that you have a system where you're not putting garbage into it and getting garbage out of it. So for example, the, um, the uh, lead systems, you know, that get, sell you leads or you know, that kind of thing. Um, and you have sort of virtual assistants farming the leads and, and doing the leads. We, we, we used to be part of a group called the Goodfellow Group and everybody was getting in on that. And we were asking like, you know, are you making a profit off that yet? Well, no, not yet, but <laughs> it was just like, well, once we hear that this is, and I'm sure it's working for some people, but it's a lot of work. It's a lot less work to yeah. farm your own existing client base, make your 220 sales a year between five agents. And then taking that active income and putting it in passive income streams, streams. We don't need to chase every, every deal. I, like the 80-20 rule, for example. Mm -hmm. We get 80% of our business from 20% of our clients. We weren't afraid to focus on those 20% of clients that generate 80% of our income. How did you identify those? What, what was the process for that? Through, uh, I think part of it's just through knowing your own clients you know, with the, uh, the agents and um, uh, in follow-up boss, we tag 
Um, we tag our top clients uh, a couple of different ways. Uh, we have VIP lists for starters. Mm -hmm. So for example, uh, you want to fix and flip uh, small income properties. We've got a VIP fix and flip of people that have flipped at least two of them with us. Okay. And everybody else is on the fix and flip list. So everything, the, so what we do with in-pocket listings, which is more than half our sales, is we'll first send them out to our VIP clients. And that's usually as far as it goes. Mm -hmm. And then if it doesn't, then it goes to our fix and flip clients. And then if they don't, it, it, then if we don't sell it, uh, then we will send it out on the MLS. And we have the permission of the client to, to do that. Uh, income properties, you pretty much know what your property is worth. And so um, most of our sophisticated investors allow us to, you know, sell it to the next investor mm -hmm. without having to go on the MLS. A lot of them are very private. They don't want uh, that going out there. Um, sorry, I keep going on tangents. I mean, as far as automation, elimination, delegation goes, um, follow-up boss does a lot of the automation work for us, keeping in touch with the clients, number one. Number two, much like you, we do use an increasing number of niche-specific virtual assistants. So, for example, the next one we're bringing online uh, is to simply do comparative market analyses once every six months for our existing clients to let them know what the property is worth, whether it's an income property or residential property. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, basically they do uh, what's called batching, which, again, is a time saver. So they'll do 50 of them at a time. They'll let our um, chief operating officer, who's a real estate agent, quickly review them to make sure they're accurate, and then they all go out. And out of those 50, you can expect about three of them to say, hey, if that's the price, I want a list. I want to free up the equity. So you get three listings out of doing those 50 CMAs through a virtual assistant that you're paying 6 to $8 an hour to. Got it. All yeah. right. I have a question, Reese, because I want to kind of step back a little bit and dig into what you guys are doing great at, and that's the finding the investment opportunities. So you're, you're using follow-up boss here to be able to tag who your VIPs are, right? Who those people are continually either feeding you opportunities or going in with you on a purchase, right? I have two questions. When you're finding these opportunities and you're, you're pairing the client that buys it with the person that's selling it, how do you guys get involved in between there? Is it by putting money in or by just finding the opportunity and managing it? Well, those are just straight up sales. Okay, got it. Right. Yeah. So those those are just straight up sales where we have existing client bases. A, a lot of times, you know, we're creating, this doesn't apply to all your, your agents because I'm sure a lot of the people watching that are using follow-up boss are uh, heavily residential, which would be typical. Yeah. Um, yep. With... With investor clients, you have to look at them differently. Um, like as real estate agents, when we're dealing with our investor clients, we see ourselves as financial advisors for real estate investment. And that means we're much more interested in building up their portfolios. Um, and as they generate that wealth, a lot of times they're middle class. They start with buying a duplex and it's really scary because they've never taken a calculated risk with money in their lives. And then once they buy that first one, it's now you're holding the reins back on the horse rather than trying to force it to drink. And you got to slow them down and you got to build up that portfolio gradually. But then now they've got four or five duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes. Now they want to cash those in or some of those cash some of those in to buy an apartment building or a commercial plaza. Right. Well, now you've got this inventory that you can sell to your next uh, person that wants to build up their portfolio. And uh, that's why you see a rotation of, of these income properties that we can keep a lot of within our, um, within our client base because we have different clients at different phases and have different goals in their investment strategies. All right. So then how do, how do you help out your agents create, create income and out of these opportunities? How do they get involved in between? Because part of the annual goals with those agents is, first of all, when they first start on the team, it's about um, what niche are you going to have? And we don't push um, income property niches per se. It, it just kind of naturally happens because it's part of the team vision that we're all trying to achieve independent wealth through uh, uh, real estate investment. So they tend to gravitate towards a, um, an investment niche. 
And so then with follow-up bots, you associate tags for those niches, for those agents. And um, what ends up happening is in, in, in this area, they become known as the expert in that niche. And it's done, again, all through follow-up boss with the mass emails, the consistent um, um, uh, promotion of opportunities. So um, we don't just stop at sort of follow-up boss mass emails and, um, and uh, the MLS system. We also uh, use Facebook quite a bit. And again, that's a separate. So we have a separate virtual assistant that's really good at mass emails. We have a separate virtual assistant who's really good at uh, Facebook promotion. Mm -hmm. The nice thing about Facebook is it creates new clients because we have a, a real estate investment Facebook group. So we're perceived as the experts in the area through that. And um, also when you're doing those sponsored ads, you can, put, you can push the sponsors ad ads out. Like, so you take your follow-up boss tag. Let's say you have uh, you know, uh, 500 really good clients that, do, uh, that buy duplexes. You can import everybody under that tag into Facebook as, as a group, and you could do sponsored ads just to that group. So when your clients existing are looking at the, the, the photos of their, their, their nieces and nephews and everything, they're also seeing your sponsored ads. They're being reminded that you exist. They're being reminded that you're the expert in that niche that they're interested in in your community. But then Facebook even allows you to create mirror groups. So let's say you've got that 500, those 500 duplex clients that are already really like you. You can now tell Facebook, hey, you know the other 500 people that we've never talked to before, but are interested in duplexes in Southwestern Ontario? Yeah, let's send out the ads to them too. And that's all done by virtual assistants that know those systems extremely well. But if you notice, as I talk it and probably meander too much, you can see that we use the database follow-up boss as a, as a foundation to, I mean, a lot of these, these delegated and automated uh, steps that we've taken to create the client base. Well, that way you, that way you know who you're targeting because you've been able to categorize them on follow-up boss. And you're like, these people are going to be here. Yeah. And you eliminate a lot of that extra work that a lot of people have to, I feel like they they recreate every time because they didn't take time to categorize correctly. Oh man, you know, your database is your bank. I don't know who said that to me at first, but it's damn right. You know, I still remember, again, this is going back to the Goodfellow group uh, that doesn't exist anymore, but it was this real estate agent with the Southern draw. His name was James and he had the big belt buckles and everything. And uh, he's an older guy. He was a watermelon farmer as well on the side. That's Somebody cool. might know who I'm talking about on here, but he he ended up getting he kind of swaggers up to the stage, and I'm like, I'm going to learn database management from this old guy. Oh yeah, it was humbling. It was humbling to hear how this guy James used his database in order to organize. And I remember looking at my chief operating officer, going, <laughs> if, "If the watermelon farmer could do it, James Wedgeworth, yes, do James it. Wedgeworth, Wedgeworth, yes." There you go. That's who it is. Thanks, yeah. Daniela. Now everybody's going to go Google There's another James Wedgeworth that's also a watermelon farmer. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> he's in my, Daniela says he's in my company. Oh, I love that. There yeah. You go. Well, so he, yeah. So his, the way that he worked his sphere of influence is he always had watermelons in the back of the truck. And whenever he happened to be driving by one of his clients, he'd stop the car, get out, give him a watermelon. How's it going? Dude, I love that. How much more effective is that stupid watermelon over a billboard or a bus stop or these other things that don't give a, a what's called a media return on investment? You have to track where your money's going with advertising. And again, this is about elimination, right? When we talk about automation, elimination, delegation, if you're not tracking your return on your media, you're burning through tons of money that's a waste. You know, you got to eliminate that. It's a waste of time. It's also a waste of uh, money, you know, true, true. James, the, the return on investment on each watermelon. <laughs> Dude, I, I agree. Reach question here. Wendy Johnson says, what Facebook system you do you currently use for your ads or company? Oh, uh, there's a Facebook business. Um, so Facebook loves, loves, loves making money 
Um, through, <laughs> Last I checked, that's true. Yeah, Zuckerberg is not going to win the Mother Teresa Prize really? anytime soon. No, but I mean, they, they basically, Facebook has collected a ton of data, right? And then they're basically saying, hey, pay us a little bit of money to advertise to use our data, right? So, um, well, that's part of the delegation then, because do you have do you have VAs running that, or do you have in-house people running that? VA. Right. And then, so that goes back to what you said at the very beginning, which is the niches, right? You focus on the niches. So when you're hiring a VA, tell me what those niches are that you're focused on for delegation. What are they? Oh, for the, with the VAs? Yeah. <sighs> okay. Well, this is going to shock some people, but we no longer have a full-time admin. Okay, good. We go deeper on that. that. Pardon me? Go deeper on that. What do you, what do you have then? She's actually working on her license. So she's going to, as long as she passes her courses, she's going to come back as a licensed assistant. But basically through the the, the, dele- the continued delegation to uh, niche specific uh, people, mostly virtual assistants, we, we kind of accidentally naturally eliminated the position. So, um, and bear in mind too, Canadian, um, uh, Canadian agents, uh, we have a deal secretary at the, at the office, at the brokerage level. So, I mean, there are some roles at a Canadian brokerage that American brokerages don't have. Deal secretary, meaning like a transaction coordinator? Yeah, they do a lot more than that too, but yeah, pretty much. Okay. Yeah, Perfect. it's in-house. So can you break down what your team looks like on the, on the staff side, whether it's in-house staff or VAs? We just want to get a better understanding of what that looks like. So we realized, I'll start with the people, like the boots on the ground. Yeah. And then I'll move to the VAs. The, the boots on the ground that we use, uh, we have a wonderful photographer uh, for the MLS listings who's more than happy to pick up the for sale signs in the lock boxes. And he does all of that for us. And then he picks up everything at the end. He's also taking a photo at the end. He has sold signs with all my different agents' faces on the sign writers. So he'll put that in the ground with the sold sticker. And that becomes your, Dude. yeah, thank you. That's yeah, good. yeah, yeah. So we don't have to go out and, and do, all, you, you know how agents are. Agents are like herding cats. Like to ask five different agents to do that, you know, three of them will, two of them won't. You know, this is one person who's paid and responsible for all that. I really wish we could have people in the photo smiling with the sold sticker. But you know what? I'm willing to sacrifice that to know it's getting done every time. That's so true. That yeah. that's actually worth more than it not happening. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. And quite frankly, the the people of we tag the we have permission to do all this up front. Like, so we have a schedule A with the listing, which is a marketing checklist, which uh, they're confirming up front that we're allowed to do a sold promotion, um, and we're allowed to tag them in that sold promotion, so it goes out to everybody on their Facebook page. And uh, anyway, so there, so Frank does all of that for us. Uh, and then with a lot of the income properties, we, we realized it wasn't so much an admin job as it was a property management job. So we asked a property uh-huh. manager that we really like, Sue. We said, Sue, do you want to do these for us, these listings, and take on these ro- roles and responsibilities of setting up a list? Because you get, you know, you got, you got to liaise with tenants, set up keys, 24 hours notice. That's a property manager's job. Yeah, that's and true. So Sue loves it because now she is already involved with that property. Now when the property sells, she's got a very, very good uh, chance of retaining that property for her business. Right? That makes so sense. She, you take care of it, then you capture it long term. More than happy to do it. So it so so she takes care of the other boots on the ground for us. And then um, the virtual assistants. Um, I got to think uh, the virtual assistants that we have, first of all, we have a general virtual assistant, Grace, mm-hmm. and uh, Grace does a lot of the database work for us. So every time a deal comes through and there's a trade record sheet through our deal secretary, the deal secretary is not only sending it to me and the agent that sold the place, she's also sending it to the chief operating officer so that he's aware and also to um also to the virtual assistant. The virtual assistant is the one that's inputting everything into follow-up boss. So a lot of data entry. Tons of data entry. 
Got yeah. It. And she's also cleaning up old mistakes with data entry right now from oh. one person that we had that wasn't that good about three years ago. Got it. So she's busy fixing all that up right now um, so that we're able to, you know, engage with more of our clients than we are right now. It, it, it's like a blip, but I mean, again, like that's virtual assistants are great for that kind of stuff. And then we have the virtual assistant for Facebook, virtual assistant for doing the marketing materials. Uh, we have a virtual assistant to edit our videos. Nice. Virtual assistant for the mass emails. And nice. I mean, it's not just about posting the mass emails. It's about getting the title, the subject on the mass emails uh, properly. So basically they know that to try four different uh, titles and they'll send it out to, um, let's say we've got 3000 people uh, in our uh, database for the mass email. They'll send it out to, 400. So they'll send it out. The first title to send out to 100 people, second title, 100 people, third title, 100 people, fourth title, 100 people. And the title that does the best, they send that out to the other 2,600 people on the list. And then whoever doesn't open that, they'll send it under the second best title to the same people 24 hours later. And you might see once in a while that you, if you're subscribed to certain um, people, you might see that you get the same email twice with the same content, but with two different yeah titles and that's, the reason is is you didn't open it fast enough the first time so Got it's, it. it's called a and b testing i love that dude but so okay. now our open click rate it used to be about 16 percent. now we're getting about 61 62 percent of people opening and engaging with our uh, mass emails i love because that, of that a and b testing so titles. where do you find typically where do you find your vas are you to the point where you're hiring direct now because you have so many or what what uh yeah, we, oh, uh, actually, yeah. So this is great for your people. Uh, use Upwork, upwork.com for all of, um, all, almost all of your VAs. Um, if you've got graphical work that needs done, um, like marketing materials, you can use Upwork, but Fiverr is also pretty good. But I wouldn't use Fiverr beyond sort of graphical stuff. All right, perfect. And then they, they uh, had some questions about how do you make sure that your systems are secure with so many different virtual assistants? Systems are secure. Um, okay, well, follow a boss. Um, we just give them their own um, account and we give them certain uh, permissions. We give them administration, administrative positions, uh, um, permissions, basically. So follow a boss, you can adjust. Like for example, the real estate agents cannot download the whole database. Right. They can't. The only yeah. people that can are me and Reed. And I think that's it. Reed's my chief operating officer. And if you're wondering how I afford a chief operating officer, uh, uh, he also sells real estate part time. We make sure the number of the, the gross commissions that he's doing, 50 percent go to the house. And that 50 percent is higher than what I'm paying him. Ah, got it. I love that, man. Yeah, That's and he's great. fine doing that because his end goal is doing much more of the private equity investment with me. Okay, got so it. So he's fine being that chief operating officer for that stuff. You got to find the right person for that. But that, that was hard. Dude, um, I, I'd love to have you on again just to talk about the um, the structure. passive the passive income and going into yeah. that whole thing. That's a whole different world, which I love. Um, but Rick, to, to answer... Uh, deeper part of that question, system security. If you use something like last login or last pass, uh, they, they offer the, the ability for you to be able to share the password that without whoever you're sharing it with to see it. So they could just log in uh, directly to that email. So that's another Correct. option as well, Rick. And then exactly what, what Reese said, which is you give them, you give them the option to log in with minimal ability to be able to do what an admin would do. And, and like Facebook business, up. sorry, Tristan. Yeah. Facebook business, same thing. Like you can limit what the different roles can do uh, within it. Yeah. And you're right. Last pass we use as well. Yeah. yeah. Joseph has a great question in, in how many investment properties do you currently, Oh, how many investment properties do you currently own equity on? Um, sometimes it's not about the number. Uh, cause you, you get into the bigger, uh, properties, you'll have fewer properties, but they generate, uh, more income. So, um, oh, geez. I mean, so right now I sold off uh, a bunch of my smaller properties to buy, uh, the dream home with my wife. Ooh. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Congrats, so again, buddy. 
What's that? Congrats. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's better to be lucky than to be good sometimes. <laughs> I would say all the time, dude. Yeah. I would rather yeah. be lucky all day long. Oh, uh, we got lucky. We got very lucky. Um, but uh, I retained uh, my larger property. So I own um, I own uh, about an 18,000 square foot building. It was built in 1888. Um, Damn, dude. Yeah, I'm in it right now, actually. Oh, that's sweet. Yes. I love that. This is it. Yeah. I, here, I'm going to show you guys. This is like the, what is it? The wizard behind the curtain? Show us. Oh, no, it's just, there's my door. <laughs> ah, very good. Good job on covering that up, dude. Yeah. <laughs> this is like the COVID setup here, right? All right, Reese, we have to have you back for, for a second one. This time going deeper into how it is that you're offering the agents that you have on the team, the ability for them to create just a better lifestyle. I really like to dig in on that because you're right. Most people are focused on working as many hours as possible and forget yeah. to enjoy the life that, that we're living. If you, so, think, if you think about how we, we set up the goals for the year, it's like, okay, you did 52 sales. And it, a lot of times not even sales. They're talking about sales volume. Like you did 17 million last year. Okay. You got to do 19 million this year. It's like, so do, true. do I really, how about we make it a goal of that, you know, anything over 17 million is great. And I, I've got to buy two fourplexes because you're working smarter at that point. In yeah. Like, life. And so I really do, you know, I really do think, you know, it's a mindset shift and it's, it's not unique. It's just very, very uncommon in North America. We're always go, go, go more sales, more sales. And it's like, yeah, I, the sales I have come naturally. We do over 200 sales and there's five of us. There's, I mean, I'm the sixth, but I don't sell directly. That's dude. That's plenty. That's plenty for everybody. Reese, yeah. where do people, where do people find you? Where do you typically gravitate to on social? So if anybody has any questions, they can ask you directly. Oh uh, yeah. Feel free to um, mm -hmm, LinkedIn for business guys. All right. Yeah. Awesome. I, I try to keep Facebook to friends, family, and, and some clients. Um, like, yeah, LinkedIn, if you want to connect with me. And then uh, the team is the vanguardteam.com. I can type it in if you want. Yeah. If, if So guys, if you look me up, it might get confusing because my acting often comes up uh, fairly high, but I assure you that does not pay the bills. Um, <laughs> but it was really funny because whoever put the graphic together today for the, uh, for the webinar yeah. clearly found my IMDB because they've used the the sort of hero with attitude photo. And I'm like, it's not really a sales photo. I'm not even smiling in it, but that's cool. Yeah, that's yeah. so funny. Yeah. yeah, I noticed that too. I was like, all right, cool. This is going to be good. It's going to be yeah. good. Yeah, Reese, I, I wouldn't be able to act without the, you know, yeah. I would, there would be no time. There'd be no time to go and act. And I had a recurring role on Disney Survivor standing right next to Kiefer Sutherland. And, I love that, uh, dude. You know, you just wouldn't have time to do all that if, you're just trying to chase the next sale and you're not really thinking about how can I work fewer hours. If I can leave everybody with one thing, it's don't forget that time is the greatest currency. It's not money. It is not money. The money will come. If you focus on time efficiency in this business, the money will keep coming. I agree, man. Great point. Reese, yeah. great ending words. We appreciate you. Thanks for being on. Let's do a part two to this and dive deeper into that passive income and growth. I appreciate yeah, you, man. Sounds great. Yeah, hey, man. Nice to meet you, Tristan. See you, guys. Thank you, buddy. Thanks, everybody.